So, welcome back. Today I am upgrading the crossover on my Triangle Borea BR-02. This is the factory crossover, as you may be familiar with if you've seen my other video. Um, I'll link my original teardown review in the description. And to recap that a little bit, I was fairly impressed with the quality of this crossover with the understanding that it is still a cheap, low-quality crossover that is designed for mass production and not maximum sound quality. The things I liked, though, um, mainly were that it had a film capacitor instead of electrolytic capacitor on the tweeter circuit. Um, and then, like, the other things with the driver, the, the drivers for the speaker are pretty good quality, and then the construction quality of the enclosure was very good. So this is um, my crossover. I know it isn't. It doesn't look all that pretty, and it doesn't need to be. It just needs to work. Um, the plate that I'm using here is quarter-inch thick ABS plastic. It is four inches wide, and this one happens to be about six inches long. Here's a six-inch scale, just so you can see. Um, it's pretty close. It's a little less than six. Um, and where I got this from is I bought some 12 inch long by four inch wide pieces of ABS plate from McMaster. They're very cheap. And then it, it comes um, with a very shiny finish, but I just sanded it down a little bit to give it a slightly rougher finish. And I think it looks a little bit better than just the, the natural finish. And then the way that I'm gonna mount this inside the speaker is with these four mounting holes, which match up with the four mounting holes on the original. Um, however, I do have to use longer screws. In my right hand here are the original screws, and I'm gonna be replacing them with one and an eighth inch number eight drywall screws, though you do need a slightly longer screw than the original because the original circuit board is only, you know, a millimeter, maybe two millimeters thick, where this one is a quarter inch thick. You could go with a thinner circuit board, but I like the rigidity that this one gives you for all the components because these components are a lot heavier than the stuff that's on the original crossover. You will notice that I do have the components zip tied down, but these two are not um, tightly zip tied down, and that's for a very important reason that I will show you right now. So here is the enclosure for the Borea, and you'll notice there's this wonderful brace that has two horizontal beams going across, one you know further up and then one further down in. And while there is enough space vertically, so from the bottom to the bottom, or you know from the base to the bottom of that support to fit all this stuff in here, even with this tall inductor standing upright, the problem is getting it in there because you have to kind of angle it down and then flatten it out. Um, there is not enough space to have the components tightly tied down before it goes in here. So the good thing is that the Borea does have wonderful cross bracing to make the enclosure more rigid. The downside is it makes it a lot tougher to mount in a crossover with the larger, better components. So the way that I did that on the other speaker, this is the second one. I decided to do some practice first, obviously is to have them loose and that, that way they have some compliance. Get it in there, screw it down, and then from the back side, from back here, that inductor and the large capacitor are sitting pretty much right here. So I can just clip off the excess. Well, first I can tighten them down from back here and then clip off the excess. I'm not going to be able to get all of the extra cable off, but it'll be more than enough to get the job done. Now, to design this crossover in terms of its layout, I did do a little more work this time than I did previously, and I made a template like this. Um, you don't need any special software for this. I literally just used, um, I think I used Pages on my Mac, but you could use, um, you know, any piece of software, even like Microsoft Paint, that will let you draw circles and rectangles um, at a one-to-one -one scale. So the now please note the positives and negatives on here are incorrect. 
I uh, must have been sleeping when I drew these because they are totally wrong and they will not work. This is the correct way to lay it out. This one happens to be a mirror of this one. Um, just because I, when I built the two crossovers, I had them mirrored to each other. Um, but you get the idea. Now these little resistors are rated at 5 watts. And the reason why I went with 5 watts instead of the usual 10 or 12 watt resistors that I've used before is because the ones that triangle spec'd out are 5 watts. Uh, they make me a little nervous being that small. But here's the thing. Um, these parts don't really dissipate all that much energy or heat. They don't really get hot. The drivers are what are doing all the work and what are actually getting pretty warm. So I'm not too concerned about it. If I have issues, I can always come back in here, clip these out, and then put in slightly bigger resistors like 10 or 12 watt. But um, I'm going to say if triangle spec 5 watt, then it should be okay at 5 watts. Don't always trust the manufacturers, but you know, you got to draw the line somewhere, right? So another reason why I modeled this out is, you can see I, I cut this out of a bigger piece of paper. I measured and modeled the entire interior of the speaker. That way I could make sure that um, when I placed all these components, it would avoid the mounting holes for um, fastening the whole thing down to the bottom of the speaker because if one of these fastening holes just happened to be like right underneath this capacitor, there's no way I'm going to be able to fasten it down to the bottom of the speaker. So that's something that I had to be aware of, as well as measuring to make sure that I had enough um, vertical height or, you know, vertical space, again, between the base and that frame. And again, I do. So, um, and you can use these values. This, these are the values that are on the crossover. Total cost on these components was, I think, $80. Uh, I don't remember exactly. I, I disassembled these speakers and bought these components several months ago. Um, I just have not had the time to rebuild the crossovers because I've been busy with other things. And for anyone who's uh, going to say something about the safety of me using a scalpel to strip the wires, don't be worried. Um, the key with it is don't put your actual finger on the blade. Um, I'm rolling the wire across the blade very gently. And because this silicone insulation is so soft, it takes almost no pressure. Um, so I can show you here on this one. This is the tweeter positive. You just select how much you want to strip off. Roll it back a little bit. Put a tiny bit of pressure. And it comes right off. I, I really love this wire. Um... This stuff, I can't remember where I got it, um, but it is really nice to work with. Um, it's an 18 American wire gauge, 200C rated, and it the wire is really nice and thick. It has a ton of strands in it, and it's very easy to solder as well. So um, I highly recommend this this cable or the you know this uh, this wire for wearing up the crossover. So at this point, I think I'm going to wire, put this into the enclosure, wire up the drivers, um, and kind of show you how I plan to tighten these down from the back. I'm just going to jump cut to there because there isn't really much I can show you because of how difficult and cramped it is to try and get this thing shoved into the box. So I will catch you when I'm ready to um, tighten up these in the back. I'm going to try and get you a good view of this here. So from this back surface here to this um, pocket, which nests the back plate, it's about five millimeters from the surface to this surface. And then this capacitor here is about, call it about 34 millimeters from this surface. So We'll round it to 40 millimeters is all it is from here to there. So it's very close to the back. And then you can see you do actually have fairly good access to those two zip ties to crank down on them pretty tightly as well as clip them off. And to do that, 
I used a forceps. So I went in and when the excess um, zip tie banding was still on there, I would lock it down and then just twist it and it would pull the excess through. On the capacitor especially, you don't want to do it, you don't want to make that too tight because it will crush it and um, that will, you know, severely damage it. But these inductors are pretty durable. Um, you can crank down on that as tight as you can and that way it's nice and rigid in there and isn't going to be making any rattling noises as the speaker is producing um, bass frequencies at loud volumes. And that's really all there is to that portion. There isn't much more to say. Um, on this one, unlike the other one, I was having a little bit of trouble getting in there, so I did have to remove this piece of um, black stuffing, but that can easily be shoved right back in there without any issues. So um, I'm gonna finish this one up here, and then I'll be back with some closing thoughts and tips and tricks to make this a little bit easier if you decide to do this yourself. And here we are with the finishing touches, putting these rubber waveguides back on here. Um, if yours don't stick down quite right, as mine may not, uh, you can always apply some new double stick adhesive, or I would imagine even hot glue could work pretty well. I don't see any reason why you couldn't use that. And these were definitely the most difficult speakers to disassemble that I've ever had to do. Um, I'm glad that they just used some relatively light duty double stick tape rather than like seriously epoxy gluing the entire thing together because then this would be impossible to do anything with. I prefer designs that have some level of serviceability to them. So. I think we can set this aside now. All right, I'm gonna use this Dayton Audio RS125P-4 as kind of a prop for something I would like to describe. And that is how you should solder onto the terminals of the woofer and the tweeter. What I did is I stripped my wire and then laid it over the top so let's say I was trying to go to the positive here. I used my forceps and clamped the tip of that wire down like this. And that way, the forceps acted as a, like a bit of a heat sink so that I didn't get too much heat going into this solder joint here. Uh, because if that gets too hot, the whole pad will start to loosen off and you could end up detaching the braided lead in there which may or may not even focus. Yeah, there you go. And that is something you definitely do not want to happen because that would be incredibly difficult to repair. And that goes for the tweeter as well. Um, for the for the triangle speakers, I found the tweeter to be much more sensitive than the woofer. And that has, I'd, I'd say, generally been my experience with soldering drivers is the tweeters tend to be a little more sensitive. The other thing is on the tweeter, the, it is not shown which one is positive or negative, but the fatter one, the wider one, is the positive, the narrower one, like this, you know, just like this set up here. Um, so if they're not labeled and you didn't double check to make sure you knew which one is positive or negative, um, the fat one should be positive. However, if for whatever reason you hook yours up that way and it doesn't sound right, go back in and re-solder them the other way around, and that should help. Um, otherwise, they'll be out of phase, and you don't want that. Here's another trick that I think is very important. To make sure that you don't puncture either the surround or the cone, or, you know, not just puncture, but damage, when you are putting each screw in, make sure you are very deliberate and you're looking exactly where this is and exactly where the hole is. Never take your eye off of them. Because if you do, for example, if I'm done screwing this one in and then I look down to the next screw, but I move my hand while I'm looking over there, I could accidentally drag this across 
um, either the woofer or the surround. Worse than that would be if you did it with a screw on the bit, because that is a lot sharper than this bit. So I think it's very important that you always have direct eye contact with where you are placing each screw, uh, because it is really not fun to damage either the woofer, or sorry, the, the cone or the surround, because you've pretty much destroyed the driver at that point, and you either have to buy a replacement speaker, a replacement pair of speakers, or if you can find one on eBay or from the manufacturer, get another driver. So make sure you're very careful when screwing things back in. And of course, the same goes for the tweeter. One final tip that I want to point out here is be very generous when cutting your speaker wires for the intern, you know, for the crossover. Um, don't, you know, don't be stingy on it. So I'll just kind of show you an example here. If you cut the speaker wires too short, um, it makes it very difficult to solder outside of the enclosure. So let's just say that this here represents the outside of the enclosure and the speaker would normally be mounted this way, but you have to bring it out here in some way to solder it. So how you decide to prop up your driver doesn't really make any difference to me. Um, just be careful. Don't, it's not a good idea to set it on the surround. You can do it very, very gently, um, but it's generally not a good idea to do that. So I usually try and prop mine up in this orientation if I can. And then I'd say from the, when you're roughly measuring out your speaker wire, here we go. You want it to be, you know, maybe six inches outside of the enclosure, which is, you know, 150 millimeters. That might seem like a lot, but it's going to make it so much easier to get these things soldered on there. And once you tuck it back in the enclosure, it's not going to hurt anything once it's in there. Um, especially if before you fully insert the driver, rotate it a few times so that the wires twist together. That way they're less likely to, you know, rattle around against anything in there, as well as um, twisting them can help to reduce any RF interference. Um, you know, that's not a huge benefit. The, R the RF interference thing isn't really a huge benefit, but you are going to thank yourself when you have really nice long leads to solder with rather than having to kind of cram it up, uh, you know, halfway inside the enclosure and get your solder and your soldering iron in there. That's just, it's a huge pain. Um, so give yourself a lot of extra room. I do have the package for this speaker wire. Um, and I looked it up. It's uh, some stuff I got off the, uh, the Amazon machine. You know, that's the package you can, Figure it out from there. 18 American wire gauge. Backwards there. And again, this is silicone insulated, I believe. I really like it because it's super flexible and it makes it really easy to work with. Well, I've come back from listening and wow. I am really astonished at the difference that just upgrading some of these components made. There is a lot more clarity and a lot more, I don't know, clarity and detail, I think, is the main thing it did. And, you know, so it, uh, it's very difficult to describe, in my opinion. Uh, sound is very subjective, but it's not so much that the frequency response is brighter. It's not like there is more amplitude in the higher frequencies but it's more like they just play through better. They, they come to your ears a little more easily than it did before. Um, I know that's a weird way to explain it, but hey, you know what? Every audio explanation is kind of weird. And a song that I think really highlights this is um, a song called Point Nemo. It's by a band called Northway, and the album for that song is called The Hovering. The electric bass intro of this song, which happens to be the first song on the album, um, really is a good song to show uh, detail because the main frequency is a bass note, so it's pretty low, but the other resonances or distortions in the, you know, that are going through the bass amp, 
to give it its sound signature are something that really sound crisp if you have the right speakers. And even though it has been I, several months since I've listened to these speakers in their stock form because I disassembled them and I didn't have a chance to rebuild them until now, I can easily tell um, that this is an improved sound, in my opinion, to my ears. It may not work for you, but it worked for me. Uh, give this song a listen. It's from the genre called post-rock. I love post-rock. It is an awesome genre. It's just really chill music, but it's still got some energy to it. Very quickly, I actually have one more song recommendation. Um, this is also, it's not exactly a post-rock. I don't really know what kind of uh, genre to call it, but this one is um, the artist I Built the Sky from the album The Zenith Rise, and the song is Diamond Dust. With these speakers and the specific upgrades that I did, the guitar, the acoustic guitar in this, feels as close to a real acoustic guitar being right in my face as I've ever heard from speakers. This video, even from my perspective from the, you know, from filming, it feels a little rushed. Um, I wasn't able to show everything I wanted quite right, but you know what? Uh, I still want to share this, even though it's not as polished as some of my other, you know, non-polished videos. So, um, once again, if you have not seen my original review and teardown of the speaker, definitely go and check that out. Again, there's I'll put a link in the description. Um, that will give you more context to what these speakers are and why I have them. And kind of what makes them good. This video is more about what I upgraded and kind of how I did it. So I think I'm going to stop babbling on because as we all know, I could talk for an hour. So uh, until next time, see ya.